Hi, everybody. This is Jason Reynolds, and uh, I'm so happy to be here today hosting a special presentation for teens for the 20th Library of Congress National Book Festival. Now, most of you know, or most of you should know, that I'm the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. But what does it mean? To put it simply, it just means that I love to read and I love to write, and I will do everything and anything in my power to make sure that you all love to read and write as well. But I didn't always like to read. You know, when I was younger, there was a, an author that sort of changed my life, a favorite author from way, way, way back then. But fortunately for you, uh, there are some favorite authors that are living and working right now. I'm gonna introduce you to them, get to know them, learn to love them, and read all their books. First up, we have my, my pal, M.T. Anderson, and illustrator Joe Ryu uh, on the book called The Daughters of East. An Atlantis-like city from Celtic legend is the setting of The Daughters of East, a graphic novel fantasy from the National Book Award winner, M.T. Anderson, and artist Joe Ryu. So, hi, my name is Joe Ryu, and I'm an author and illustrator. Uh, I love to work on children's books, most of all, and especially graphic novels. I'm beaming in from uh, my home in uh, Carp, Ontario, which is just on the outskirts of Ottawa, which is my hometown. I am M.T. Anderson. Um, I am a writer of books for children and for teens and for adults. Um, and uh, I am coming to you from rural Vermont in a, uh, a creaky old haunted house I live in. So this project is, um, you know, the Daughters of East, which is uh, with a script by me, and then Joe did the illustrations. It is a, uh, a graphic novel for older teens and adults. I knew your books before I, I was approached by First Second to do this project. I had read Octavia Nothing, and I really loved it. And I'm wondering what's different about writing graphic novels in comparison to prose? And the thing that I really loved about it was, in fact, the idea that, you know, it, for me, what I do when I'm writing a graphic novel, and this is the only the second one that I've done, but I write something that looks like a Hollywood script, you know, that has sort of lines of dialogue and, and just some pretty basic descriptions of what's going on. And so to me, the magic of working on this, especially with someone as talented as Joe, is that I get to sort of see what their imagination makes out of my words. They take it and make it into their own thing then. So to me, that was really kind of an, an incredible part of working on this, which is, you know, um, this is based on a Breton folk tale. So a tale, a kind of an old Celtic tale from, um, from the coast of France. And so taking this material that's very old, turning it into one thing, handing it over to you, and then seeing what you uh, made of me. It was really, really fun with Joe to do this game of, like, when someone says something to you, you open yourself up to it, and you're like, wait, think about it in terms of the project, not in terms of what I originally envisioned, but what it will look like in the end. So Joe had all sorts of suggestions for little ways the plot could be adjusted and improved. And um, it was super, because it honestly it made, the, it made the project better. There needs to be a person who has this range between the sort of the beauty on the one hand, but also this almost uh, absurd story, kind of like fairy tale type violence at other times. And I thought that that was one thing that really was wonderful about what you did, was you were able to capture both of those things very credibly. Thank you. Uh, spookiness and... Um things that are you know kind of on the darker side it has they've always been something that that uh captivate me um but then my drawings tend to always turn out very cute so the two the two kind <laughs> of end up merging together um and at 
I have to say uh, some years ago, it used to drive me crazy because I wanted to do like really dark stuff. And, and then I would show people and, you know, I would show people like, look at my ghost. And they're like, oh, he's adorable. And it's like, no, he's, he's, he's scary. Uh, but now I've completely embraced it. And, you know, the, the spooky scary is just my combination now. And uh, I'm rolling with it. And I think it, it did that's, come out. That's perfect for this. Yeah, and in um, in Daughters of East, I think it it came out really nicely. It's exactly the type of story that is for me. So I, I mean, I do feel like even though this story is ancient, I mean, it's a story that is older than Christianity, probably. Um, at the same time, it has a kind of a weird relevance now, um, and partially coming from like that stuff we were just talking about with the combination of the grotesque and the beautiful. Not just that the world is a place that is at once both uh, grotesque and beautiful, but also because it's about a civilization that in a sense doesn't want to confront the costs of living the way that they do. And eventually those costs catch up to you. And then this, this, the city falls beneath the waves. The, the whole thing comes crashing down. I just want to finally say, because the uh, theme of the festival is American ingenuity, that, um, you know, uh, books like this one, and I hope that others that I've done, I, really the focus is both on the peril that America is in, but also on the fact that we can find a way forward and we must find a way forward. And I'm so glad that you as young readers are going to be taking up that banner and marching alongside of us into the future. For me, the message of the book was uh, to have the courage to stand up for your responsibilities, um, not just as you know, member of whatever country you're for, but as a human being. And uh, I hope that you'll enjoy the book when you pick it up. Next up, we have Mike Corrado with his book, Flamer. Award-winning author and artist Mike Corrado draws on his own experiences in Flamer, his debut graphic novel, telling a difficult story with humor, compassion, and love as he navigates friendships, deals with bullies, and spends time with Elias, a boy he can't stop thinking about. Hi, I'm Mike Corrado, and I'm coming to you today from my work studio here in Northampton, Massachusetts. So I'm going to be talking about my new graphic novel, Flamer. Uh, it is a young adult story about a boy named Aiden, who is at a scout camp the summer before his first year of high school, uh, and the year is 1995. Aiden is a little bit of a shy kid who's dealing with a lot of stuff at the same time. Um, he is navigating friendships, dealing with bullies, dealing with racism, struggling with his religion and body image, uh, all while confronting his sexual identity. And uh, all of this culminates in a really difficult and hard decision for him. Uh, so it's a story that's very close to my heart. Um, I can relate with a lot, uh, that Aiden dealt with myself and, uh, it's my hope that, um, kids like me can read this book and see themselves in it. I didn't have a story like that when I was a teenager and I hope that other teens can read it who don't have that experience, um, and they can better understand what someone like Aiden or myself uh, uh, could be going through. There were several things that inspired me to write this story. Um, like I said, I didn't see myself in a lot of books or any books really uh, when I was growing up. And a few years ago, there was uh, a new movement called the We Need Diverse Books movement. Um, which has been a call to publishers and authors alike to be more inclusive of different types of people in children's books and to support um, 
authors speaking in their own voices, supporting uh, different minority authors uh, who don't always make it to the shelf. Uh, and I think it's really important for many different stories to be told. And I think that if we knew everyone's story, there would be a lot more compassion in the world. I know that for myself as a teenager growing up and not seeing myself anywhere in the world, I started to feel like I wasn't supposed to be in this world. Um, LGBTQ youth are at higher risk for suicide and self-harm and homelessness. Uh, and that is a pandemic in itself. Um, and the data that we have for that is only based on um, the youth that have come forward and, and shared that. And I'm sure the numbers are much higher uh, if we included questioning youth who haven't come forward. Uh, so I hope that this book can lend some strength and send some love to the people that need it. I wouldn't be the person I am today if I didn't have libraries when I was growing up. Um, the library was a safe haven for me, not only because I could access books, but the librarians that I knew were kind and let me just hang out there. Um, it was a quiet place to think and um, explore new ideas, do my homework. Um, and honestly, I didn't feel very safe in other parts of my school um, because of who I was. And so I felt like I was gonna be okay sitting in the library with a book. Um, and sometimes uh, there was one librarian that would let me sneak my lunch in there. Um, but she's retired now, so she can't get in trouble <laughs> for me sharing that. Uh, I just want to send all the love I can to all the librarians around America right now. Um, I know some personally who are uh, working so hard to make sure that even during uh, these times, these COVID-stricken times, that uh, their communities still have access to books. I know librarians that are personally delivering books to people's homes um, and just keeping those resources and that community going. So thank you so much for everything that you do. The next author is a friend of mine and one of my personal heroes, the great Tanya Bolden with her book, Changing the Equation, 50 Plus U.S. Black Women in STEM. Award-winning author Tanya Bolden explores Black women who have changed the world of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in America, including groundbreaking computer scientists, doctors, inventors, physicists, pharmacists, mathematicians, aviators, and many more. This book celebrates more than 50 women who have shattered the glass ceiling defied racial discrimination and pioneered in their feats. Hello, hello, hello. This is Tanya Bolden, author, co-author, and editor of more than 40 books, most of them for children and teens. And I'm joining you today from my hometown of New York City. For the most part, when the subject is STEM, very often the names and faces of Black women are not top of mind. And I also hope that the book would inspire readers to consider charting courses for careers in STEM. Mm, when I think of the festival's theme, especially American ingenuity, I think of our co current COVID crisis. I think of all the men and women across the country who are using science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to develop treatments and vaccines to rethink medical supplies and equipment and to reimagine spaces from schools to offices to get us through this, to make things better. I live in history and libraries are my lifeline, especially the Library of Congress. I mean, it was at the Library of Congress that a few years ago I stumbled upon 
a journal of remarkable but unknown, relatively unknown Black man from the 19th century, Michael Shiner. That discovery led to my book, Capital Days, Michael Shiner's Journal and the Growth of Our Nation's Capital. Another recent book of mine is Facing Frederick about the very well-known Frederick Douglass. And that book was enriched because I had access to materials in the Frederick Douglass papers at Library of Congress. And it was at the Library of Congress and upon a blog that I learned about one of the amazing women that changed the equation, Josephine Salone Yates. And it's thanks to the Library of Congress that I have a wonderful photograph of her in the book. And so for me, for my readers, libraries are portals, they are gateways to world, a world of knowledge, to discoveries, to adventures, and so much more. As Dr. King said, we are made by history. If you don't know what has happened before, you don't have context for your present era. You don't understand what has shaped you and what, is, what has gotten you to this point. You know, it's like um, you want to understand debates about big government, small government. Well, you need to know about the New Deal of the Great Society. You want to understand race relations in this country, then you need to know about slavery, all of it. And good storytelling, um, using the same techniques people use in fiction uh, and in poetry, whether that's alliteration, whether that's intrigue and drama, conflict, um, treating it as though I was writing fiction. Thank you so much for being a part of this fantastic festival. Keep hope alive, keep reading, keep learning, keep questioning, keep growing, keep increasing the peace. Thank you so much. Next up, we have a young poet who's going to grace us, pun intended. Her name is Grace Ruo, and she is one of the champions from the St. Louis Slam team. Uh, she's here to recite a poem about her Kikuyu grandmother. Give it up for Grace Ruel. Manifestations, a letter to my grandmother. Shosho, ikoishi, dagiri okuiro rea goedete. Every time I try to tell you how much I love you, the words get lost in my refusal to condemn the colonizers, you see. I do love you, grandmother. So much so that I'm willing to admit that you were right that I did in fact cut the chain that links me to my culture, but I didn't realize it until I went to a friend's house for dinner last night. His walls were white as the lies his grandfather taught him to hide behind and his parents thought themselves saviors. Preached about appropriation, but called it discovery grandmother. They told me of manifest destiny, of how their forefathers taught them to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, how they could teach me. They must not have known that I am granddaughter of a culture they couldn't cage, of a woman with skin the color of land she fought tooth and nail for, but how could they? When every day I watch as they make my last name more palatable, pretzel it around their tongues as if Ruo cannot go down without being regurgitated, as if it bitters the backs of their throats and his parents. They told me in order to make it to the top, I'm to let go of everything keeping me on the ground. Like Kikoyo, it's like English is the only key into this land of the free and they said I can't afford to be locked out. That I'm to speak this language as if it were the one that I was born into. See, they must not have known that I am daughter of a mother tongue unmuted, but how could they? When each day I indulge in the sin that is this language, Douse my tongue in English before I leave the house. And when I come back home, I scrub it off. Try to find scattered bits of Gekoyo, place them on the tip of my tongue. I call it my act of repentance. Try not to think about how if you could hear me, you'd tell me that my tongue is no longer pure. That because I've decided to carry myself as if my culture has nothing to do with my identity, then maybe I've given what's left of my sense to pay for my American dream. And you're right, because this country has everything there is to offer. And I'd be damned if I didn't take advantage because this family could teach me to be American as the apple pie we had for dessert. See, his father cut into it with a hunting knife. Told me it's been in his family for generations and I wondered, 
How many of my people breathe their last by this blade? And your voice beckoned me to run, but in a language I've been taught to forget because this country has everything there is to offer, but feels like the only thing it wants to give me is amnesia. Does not want me to realize that my destiny is to manifest everything their grandfathers taught them to forget. I, with skin the color of land you fought tooth and nail for, am nothing if not a testament to your victory. So may they look at me and see you. May I never again disregard their desecration of my culture. May my tongue tell of all the wickedness they failed to omit. I am a manifestation of everything they dare disregard and I will make it so that they never forget. Next up, we have Rebecca Boggs Roberts and Lucinda Robb with their book, The Suffragist Playbook. Take a few tips from some of the most incredible women leaders who led the longest and least known movements in American history. We're very excited to be here today to talk a little bit about our book, The Suffragist Playbook, Your Guide to Changing the World. We first got the idea for this book several years ago as we were preparing for the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that gave women the vote, the right to vote. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine and she was saying that she didn't know a lot of the history behind the suffrage movement. Usually it gets maybe a couple of paragraphs in a history book. Maybe you've heard of one of the names, but usually most people don't have an idea of how this happened, one of the greatest expansions of the vote in the United States history. And Beck and I both come from a background where we have very strong mothers and grandmothers, and we know about the important role that women played in politics. And we wanted to really shine a light of their accomplishments, especially because one of the great things about studying the suffrage movement is that they had a lot of smart tactics that activists today can use for almost any way that you want to make the world a better place. A few years ago, I wrote a book about the suffrage movement here in Washington, D.C., and Lucinda came to me and said, you know, I really think we need a young reader's version of suffrage history. There needs to be some way for people to get access to these stories earlier. And we talked about maybe writing a graphic novel, but neither of us can draw in any way. And we sort of went back and forth on different ways to make this history relevant to a younger audience. And we realized that the things the suffragists pioneered, the tactics that they used to make sure that women were enfranchised when they were, are things any activist can use at any time. And in fact, they were things the suffragists invented uh, in order to get their cause through. And so whether you're fighting for something enormous, like climate change, or something really small, like you know, changing the traffic patterns on your block, you could do a lot worse than to learn from the suffragists and the way they succeeded. So tactics like uh, making sure everything looks exactly right and gets picked up um, virally because of the imagery. We think of that as an artifact of the Instagram age, and it's super not. You know, 100 years ago, the suffragists were really smart about making sure things looked fantastic in pictures so that newspapers would pick them up all over the country. Um, they made messages go viral in 1917 by sewing words onto a banner and standing in front of the White House, uh, which seems crazy now, but just think what those women would have done with social media. I mean, those banners the suffragists held were tweets. Um, they cultivated allies, which is so vital to any social movement. Uh, they, by definition, could not introduce legislation. They could not vote for it. They could not affect the change they needed to make because they weren't men. And so they needed male allies from the very beginning. And there are just so many lessons reverberating throughout the 20th and 21st century with almost any social cause you can think of uh, that the suffragists did first and best. There is no way to study suffrage history without the Library of Congress. It is just an extraordinary resource. and. Uh, one of the amazing things about being able to study 20th century history, and um, my focus of the suffrage movement is more 20th century, and Lucinda covered the 19th century. That's sort of how we divided things up. But in the 20th century, of course, there's amazing photographs, and they are striking and beautiful, and there's tons of them. And the Library of Congress has them all available for free to download at any resolution you want. And the fact that you can almost participate in this movement from the comfort of your own bedroom on your laptop is such an extraordinary resource. But then the Library of Congress also has the National Women's Party papers. And um, 
I think they've even discovered more things that they didn't know they had uh, when the library put on the um, exhibit for the centennial last year. They discovered all kinds of artifacts that really tell the story of this movement. And so the Library of Congress is unique and extraordinary and local to me. I'm so lucky to live in the town where I can just sort of swan on down there and use the resources. But so many of the resources are digital that almost anybody does have access to them. But these were women who were trying to participate and to have an active say in what was happening in our democracy before they actually had a vote. And what really surprised me is I'd never heard of a lot of these women. I'd never known anything about this engagement and all of the lobbying and the politicking and the ways that they were trying to influence things behind the scenes before they actually had the right to vote themselves. So then when we talk about the suffrage movement, we're talking about three generations. And in fact, um, most of the first wave of suffragists lived very long lives, some of the most well-known leaders, and all of them died before they actually had the opportunity to vote. It was a 72-year struggle. But at the same time, they would look back and say, it's not always easy to see how many things have changed, but in this process, so much happened for women's political activism. When they first started speaking out, it was literally controversial for women to speak in public, period. In fact, women weren't even supposed to applaud in public. You weren't supposed to make any noise. So you'll often read in sort of 19th century accounts, they talk about women waving their handkerchiefs because that's how you were supposed to applaud. And when Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony got to the end of their lives, um, they did, they said, it's, we're not there we haven't gotten it yet, but so much has changed. The fact that women had the right to their own property, the fact that women could speak in public because it became more common for women to go on to higher education, in fact, even enter the professions. And women were doctors and lawyers and journalists. Um, all of the activity that they'd gotten involved in um, really made a difference. So looking at something only from the, the sort of has everything changed movement, sometimes it's helpful to step back and see, you may not have gotten all of your goals, but you probably have changed the landscape a lot in that time. I do think social change happens a great deal more faster, more quickly um, than it did back in the time of the suffragists. But making legislative change is still hard and it will still take time. But a way to think of it in my mind is a lot of times what you're doing is you're planting the seeds and for a long time, you don't actually see the results. You Nothing appears to be above ground. But at some point, they've been watered enough that you do start to see they take root, they grow, and you start making massive changes in public opinion. And that's why I always like to point out that as tough as it was to get the 19th Amendment passed, now today, you can't imagine finding anyone who would be against the idea that women should have the right to vote. It became so much part of our understanding of what American democracy is all about. That even if you're too young to vote, even if you're fighting for a cause that feels like it's a real long shot right now, everyone in all of our flaws and all of our weirdness and all of the mistakes we all make can change the world for the better. We really can. And Susan B. Anthony said, failure is impossible. We absolutely agree, and we can't wait to see what you all do next. Next, we have two of my dear buddies. I'm so happy they're here. Becky Albertalli and Aisha Saeed. Yes, no, maybe so. Two teams of varying backgrounds come together and fall in love through political canvassing. Can't get no better than that. I am Becky Albertalli, one of the authors of Yes, No, Maybe So, um, and I am coming to you from um, Roswell, Georgia, which is um, a suburb of Atlanta. Hi, my name is Aisha Saeed, and I am the co-author with Becky for Yes, No, Maybe So, and I am also in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, No, Maybe So is a young adult book about two teens, Jamie and Maya, and about their summer as they're canvassing for their local special election. And it follows both of them as they go from being unwilling canvassers to really realizing just how much is at stake. And at its heart, it's also a love story. 
And the love story rom-com aspect was actually really important to us. Kind of funny to be um, describing our book as a rom-com about a really horrific cultural moment in the United States. Um, everything in the last couple of years has felt um, really fraught, especially for anybody who belongs to any marginalized group, and both Jamie and Maya do. It's so important um, for marginalized kids and adults and people to always be reminded that, um, you know, they um, deserve uh, moments of joy. They deserve um, happiness and um, crushes and um, just, you know, like weird, awkward um, kind of analyses of, you know, of the other person's feelings and all of these things um, that are hallmarks of the rom-coms that we love and were inspired by. Maya is Muslim and Jamie is Jewish. And so the book tackles issues that have specifically affected Jewish and Muslim communities even more so than they were previously after this 2016 election. And so the book explores Islamophobia, it explores anti-Semitism, which are unfortunately, they grow more and more pressing with every passing day. So, um, and so yeah, those are two issues that also are covered in the book. And yet, as Becky said, joy is so important, even in the hardest of times. And so despite the fact that we're taking on all these different topics, there is a lightness because that is how we continue to keep on keeping on is by finding those moments of joy and holding on to them. And so we 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 have a lot going on in this book, but it's, uh, <laughs> I think because because the heavy themes are also there's also a lot of laughter um, that it kind of all balances each other out. For anybody out there who's thinking about writing with uh, with their friend, uh, I will have to say it is genuinely one of the best experiences of my writing career. I I tell Becky this all the time. I feel like I've been spoiled. I want to write every book with her. I'm like, it's boring. I have to sit here and write it myself now. I want, I want to share it with you immediately, just like we used to. I want to bounce ideas off. Um, those are the those are the joys of being able to co-write with somebody and somebody that you're very close to that you feel that comfort level with is such a gift. Um, and really um, especially if you're a new writer, if there's a writer that you, another fellow friend that is a writer that you trust, perhaps writing together can give you that motivation to keep on going because you have somebody who's there to give you that feedback right away and that you can keep on going. But um, yeah, so those are, there's definitely a lot of great positives of working with somebody to write a story. Yeah, um, so I have actually done two collaborations so far. In addition to um, Yes, No, Maybe So with Aisha, I also um, did um, a book called What If It's Us with my friend Adam Silvera. And for me, uh, both experiences have been fantastic. Like, it is the hardest part has definitely been uh, reacclimating to writing solo books. I think um, for any young people who uh, may be watching this, first of all, I just want you to know, like, we see you. And this is such a tough moment. This is a thing that, like, I never had to go through as a teen. Um, the uh, pandemic, um, a lot of the um, just, you know, the racism that is, um, you know, not at all subtle, that is coming from directly from, you know, people in uh, positions of power in this country. Um, you know, the uh, racism and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and, um, you know, homophobia, trans, all of that has been there. None of this is new, but the rock kind of got turned over. We can't unsee what's underneath it. Um, so I just want to start by kind of validating kind of any feelings you might have in this moment. If you're old enough and you're eligible to vote, please vote. It's coming <laughs> up very soon. Every vote is going to matter. And also, as difficult as things are, I really, really encourage you to hold on to hope and to find small moments of joy each day because this is a long haul. This is not a sprint. 
we are going to be going through this for some time. And so we have to take care of ourselves and find moments that are going to keep us going. We'll get through this. Next up, we're going to have an incredible musical exhibition from teens from Chicago, Detroit, and Miami who came together to make music using archives from the Library of Congress. Give it up for Citizen DJ. All right, now I have some Citizen DJ things pulled up. Um, I used this one just now, but I didn't really make anything out of it. Right. So I'll throw some I'll throw some fat swing. Some drums. Got some keys lined up. So I like uh, the Citizen DJ stuff because along with like some instrumental stuff, I can throw in some like skits and stuff, whatnot. Um, so. Good morning, Henry. Good morning, Professor. Huh. You came early today for your music lesson, huh? But it's all right. You get your cornet and I will call Lena to play the piano for you. Lena, Le Lena, Le Lena. All right, Papa. All, all right, Papa. Lena. Cool thing, too, um, that same track, I grabbed Lena, that, that sample, and made a synth out of it. They kind of work together. Um, uh, then pull out and then grab just like a new sample or something. I gave a little I'll that just mess so around insane. for hours grabbing oh new God. things <laughs> just different stuff I just want to point well. out to the audience that this was completely improvised next up we're gonna have uh, some words from my pal my buddy my little sister the incomparable Nick Stone with a sequel to the number one New York Times bestseller Dear Martin which is called Dear Justice incarcerated teen Quan writes letters to justice about his experiences in the American juvenile justice system, which we all know will make for a wonderful novel. Hello, I am Nick Stone, the author of a bunch of books, including Dear Martin, Odd One Out and Jackpot. And today I am very excited to be talking to you about the follow-up novel to Dear Martin. It's kind of a sequel, kind of a companion. Uh, it's a sequel time-wise, but a companion in the sense that it's about a different character and it is called Dear Justice. So I currently am in Atlanta, Georgia. It's hot and muggy here. Um, Atlanta is also the city where Dear Martin is said and it's where Dear Justice is said. So it's almost like I'm in the land of my story, which is exciting. Uh, and I am sitting on the floor in my best friend's bedroom because I can't really do anything at my house with my two small children at home. Um, I have two sons, one is four, the other one is eight, and they have been cooped up in the house for a really long time. So at this point, they basically are just elephants 
running around everywhere. Uh, and it can be kind of hard to get any kind of work done there. So I typically leave during the day and go work elsewhere. And I do appreciate my friend for allowing me to come and sit and do things here. So let's rewind a little bit. Um, in November of 2012, there was an incident in Jacksonville, Florida, that it's safe to say kind of turned my head upside down. Um, a young man named Jordan Davis went to a convenience store with his friends one night. I'm guessing they went to get like Doritos and Gatorade because what else do you get from a convenience store when you're 17 on a Friday night? While they were there, they were sitting in their car and they had the music turned up loud. And another patron pulled into the parking lot, was bothered by the sound of the music, the volume of the music. And he started an argument with these young men or these boys. They're definitely boys. And within three and a half minutes, this man had pulled out a firearm and started shooting. And Jordan Davis was killed during this incident. I, at that time, was living abroad. I lived in Jerusalem, Israel at that point. And I had just had a baby. So I'd had, my, my son, my older son, uh, was five months old at the time. And coming to realize that I had birthed this little boy who looked, you know, he was brown skin. Eventually he will occupy a body similar to that of Jordan Davis's, realizing I had birthed him into a world where a boy like him lost his life over loud music shook me up really good. So we'll fast forward a little bit more. There was an incident involving a young man named Michael Brown. Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. And in response to Michael Brown's death, protests and marches broke out all over the country, not unlike the ones that we saw recently after the death of George Floyd. Um, in Minneapolis. So all of these things are going on. And I kept hearing people quote Dr. King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and say things like, Dr. King would never do some of the things that you protesters are doing, et cetera. Um, when the mayor of Atlanta, which is where I am, like I said, in my home, got on the news ahead of a march here one day and said, all I ask is that you don't take the freeways. Dr. King would never take a freeway. I was a little bit like, which Dr. King is he talking about? Uh, the Dr. King that I knew of took a lot of freeways. Thus was born Dear Martin. So Dear Martin involves a 17-year-old Black boy named Justice who experiences racial profiling. And as a result, he decides to start a journal of letters to the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to see if Dr. King's teachings will hold up now, basically. So that book is set in like 2017, I think. In that book, we meet another young man. So where Justice is this character, this black boy who's doing everything right. He's got the great grades. He's the captain of the debate team. He's headed to an Ivy League university. Like he is doing the thing. Um, there's another character that we meet in Dear Martin named Quan. Now Quan, we meet in juvenile detention. So. Second chapter of Dear Martin, we find out that the police officer who profiles justice in the opening chapter has been killed. And the person who confessed to this killing is this young man named Quan. Justice and Quan grew up together like a block apart. And so justice is very shaken by the by the idea that Quan is the person who killed this police officer who like basically sets justice on his journey. So he goes to visit Quan in the second half of Dear Martin, which is when we meet him for the first time. Well, once I closed the pages of Dear Martin, I thought I was done. Like, I thought I was done with that world, those characters, etc. But then I got a set of text messages from a couple of my mentees one day. These are Black boys who just graduated from high school in Columbia, Missouri. And something that they said was that while they loved Justice's story, it didn't really reflect their lives. And they asked me to tell another story that would reflect their lives. At the same time, I got a message from my editor, the woman who edited Dear Martin, who also edited the Magic School Bus, which is like the coolest thing ever to me. Like my editor edited the Magic School Bus, come on. Um, but anyway, her name is Phoebe. And Phoebe told me that she would like to see a story about Quan. So I had these two incidents happen very close together and I decided that I was going to tell the story of a Black boy who's not like Justice, who is not super high achieving, 
who is not headed to the Ivy Leagues, who is not the captain of a debate team, who doesn't even half the time he ma- barely makes it to school um, and whose life circumstances, his home circumstances are very different from justices. And I really wanted to examine the ways, the ways that our circumstances affect us, but also the fact that a lot of people don't consider that when they interact with us. Um, a lot of people don't consider what a, an African-American kid might be going through at home when they're disciplining them at school, you know? So I really, my, my goal with Dear Justice is to highlight the humanity of what is an oft forgotten population. And that's like incarcerated youth, especially incarcerated black and brown youth. Um, so my hope is that with Dear Justice, people just start to open their eyes a bit wider and pay more attention and ask more questions and care a little bit more about the people around them. And our anchoring author for today is my buddy and someone I greatly admire, Saba Tahir, who is here to talk about her blockbuster series and Ember in the Ashes, including uh, a standalone graphic novel, which happens to be the prequel, which takes place years before the Ember in the Ashes series, entitled A Thief Among the Trees. My name is Saba Tahir, and I am the author of An Ember in the Ashes, the series, and co-collaborator on the Ember graphic novel, which is called A Thief Among the Trees. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, A Sky Beyond the Storm, which is the fourth book in the Ember Quartet. Um, But I'm also going to talk about the series as a whole. So if you haven't read the series, I'm not going to spoil the earlier books. So hopefully you'll still be able to enjoy the talk. Um, The Ember series takes place in a Roman-inspired empire. And it's about a girl named Laia. She's a lower-class citizen um, who is fighting to rescue her brother, Darren. Um, from imprisonment. It is also about an empire soldier. His name is Elias and he's training um, at a military academy and he wants to be free of everything that the empire and this academy is forcing him uh, to do. When um, I was in my early 20s, (laughs) I was writing a book and it was a book, it was like a memoir. And I called my mom up because I was like, this is not going well. I'm having such a hard time. And she's like, well, you know, you're like 21. You probably don't have that much to write about. Um, so she, she suggested I write a fantasy novel. And so that was one part of my inspiration for writing Ember. So there's the work I did at the Washington Post. There's my mom saying, hey, go write a fantasy novel. But my favorite part of the inspiration story for Ember is um, that I was working late at the Washington Post one night. Um, I always used to work you know, get home between like 11.30 and 2 a.m. So this was one night where I, I finished work. I got home very late and there was a huge storm in D.C. It was thundering and raining. It was sort of one of those classic D.C. summer storms. And um, I got into my home, which was a walkout basement at the time. And as I looked out the windows, I saw two red eyes staring at me through the storm. And I was like, that's a gin. And I ran and hid in my room because... Um, it was a gin. I didn't know it might get me. So um, I'd been raised with sort of this this mythology and these stories that, you know, gin loves storms and, you know, they like to walk near trees. And so um, that that night, I kind of got this idea of a gin walking in a storm. Um, and that's that's those three elements are really what inspired An Ember in the Ashes. The concept of American ingenuity to me Um, means a few different things. First, I have to ask myself, what does it mean to be American? Um, To me, to be American is to hold many things inside you at at one time, Um, to understand that the the principles this country was founded on, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are noble and beautiful things, but the implementation and the execution of those principles has not always been noble and beautiful. and as a result, America is very much a work in progress. It is, um, it is a story that's still being told. And so, you know, we're we're all part of that story. Um, America is sort of only in, as ingenious as as we are. Uh, we're the heroes of this country's story. And the thing about stories, and the thing about being a hero in the story, is that it's not always wonderful. It's not always easy. The hero of a story gets frustrated, they get hopeless, um, they they are lost sometimes, they don't know what to do. And when that happens, you look to the other heroes around you, the people who are also part 
of your story and of the American story, and you find inspiration from them, and you tell yourself, I'm going to fight with these heroes, and I'm going to stand up with these heroes, and I'm going to contribute my own tiny story to the vast story um, that, that is America. Telling your own story um, is very intimidating. Um, telling any story is intimidating. But I would say as somebody who has tried to tell multiple stories and then ended up telling, telling this one, telling the story of Ember, um, you have to start. Um, you have to, to decide that you're going to do it. So that's thing number one. And then to me, I think it's just really important to ask the what if question start with just a single concept. So, you know, an example that I have is let's start in a nursery. It's a plant nursery. Okay. What if the plant nursery is owned by um, a single dad? And what if the single dad is in deep in debt? And what if being deep in debt, he decided to take out a loan from the loan shark? But what if the loan shark is like, you owe me money and now I'm going to break your kneecaps because you haven't paid it back. But then what if our single dad, our, our, our business owner, realizes that he has something on the loan chart that he can hold over his head and now we have a little war between them. Really all I'm doing is asking what if questions. So if you have a story that you want to write, take a simple concept and start asking those what if questions. And it can be about your own life, which can sort of, you can ask these questions and take it into fiction. Um, or it can be, you know, it can be nonfiction. You can write, be writing about someone else or about yourself. And you can still be asking those what if questions of yourself. Um, you know, what if I had done this instead of that? I think starting from that place allows you to really find the story in, in, in anything. So recently I collaborated with Boom Studios, um, Nicole Andelfinger and Sonia Liao to create an Ember graphic novel prequel. So this takes place before the events of an Ember in the Ashes. It's called A Thief Among the Trees. Um, and I created the story and Nicole created the script for the story. And then Sonia created the art for the story. There was also a colorist, um, there was a letterist. And it was an incredible experience because I had never worked with a team in that way before, um, where I was sort of, you know, looking at the script and also looking at the art. And, you know, we were talking about how to make, you know, a certain feeling rise up from the art or, or how to how to get the script exactly right. So I learned so much from the process and it really made me realize two things. One, I really actually enjoy working in a team. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, and and two, that sometimes telling a story through a different format allows you to focus on things that you don't get a chance to do in in the prose um, prose version of the story. So in the case of a thief among the trees, um, I really learned a lot about dialogue. Um, and, and scripting and sort of how to let dialogue tell the story as opposed to having all the exposition that you often have in, um, in, in, a, in a prose, you know, a regular fiction book. The library was a, a safe haven. It was a sanctuary for me. And I think it is a sanctuary for so many children. And I think that librarians are, you know, they're confidants and they are friends to so many children. Um, uh, because sometimes you don't feel like you can go to your teachers and you don't feel like you can go to your principal. Uh, principle, but there's something about a library that's magical and has all this possibility and this sort of feeling that um, while you can go on adventures in a library, no one's necessarily going to come get you and, and and harm you in a library, like you're safe there. So those two things combined kind of make for the perfect place to me. So um, I love libraries. I think they're amazing. <laughs> And closing us out today, back again, we have Citizen DJ bringing forth another wonderful musical exhibition. It's important to note, this music was made from archives from the Library of Congress. Take us home. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C.
Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all have had uh, as much fun as I've had. I hope it's been as inspiring and encouraging to you to hear such wonderful authors, musicians, poets all come together. Um, this has been a treat uh, as we close out this 20th uh, National Book Festival. This is the beginning of it though, so please stick around and see some other cool things and cool panels and, and, and presentations. Uh, and more importantly, we'll see you back here next year for the 21st. I'm Jason Reynolds, your National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Be safe, be kind, and I'll see y'all soon. Peace.